When you think about it, all law, all legislation is about the restriction of freedom. That is exactly what we're doing here. We are restricting freedom. But we're doing it for the common good, yeah. You will see that throughout our constitution, yes, you have rights, but they are restricted for the common good, yeah. Everything needs to be balanced. And if your views on other people's identities go to make their lives unsafe, mm, insecure, and cause them such deep discomfort <laughs> that they cannot live in the peace, then I believe it is our job as legislatures to restrict those freedoms, yeah, for the common good. All right. Um, when I admit I could have done that much better if I had more time, was more patient, if I could have found an AI generator to transcribe audio in a German accent. I did that. That was my idea. Someone... <laughs> Actually, Luke Rudkowski, in responding to that Irish, um, she's the Green Party uh, senator. I don't know how it works. She's an actual, uh, I think she's a member of European Parliament. Something involved in the Irish Green Party. Although I dubbed that over in a Germanic accent, a very bad one, yeah. And then I slowed it down so that you would sound like this and it was easier to coordinate the time. That was verbatim what she said. It's like, it's, I, I mean, <sighs> We have gone a long way. We have strayed a, a, a fair distance from Ayn Rand. There is no greater minority than the individual. And if you don't support individual rights, you don't support minority rights. Some, I mean, it's so amazing. Like when you say something in an Irish accent, it sounds so nice. Hey, we're going to lock you up for that meme there, eh, boy? Oh, don't take it personally. It's just for the greater good, eh? You can't upset people's feelings, whatnot. Nuts. Um, today's show is going to be amazing. It's amazing. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain. I thought it was supposed to be Arnold. Uh, it could have been Arnold. It was just, you know, there's, there, for the history of humanity, there will be no greater accent, great, no greater menacing accent, or I should say no more menacing an accent since a German or a Japanese. I mean, it's, it's like maybe it's just because of culturally where we're brought up, where for once upon a time, the, you know, the, the villains in movies were Germans, Russians, Japanese. Uh, but I bet you in other parts of the world, they have the most menacing accent to them. It's the Canadian one, eh? Oh, yeah, I can take this out of here. I eh? get that get that chat off the screen. She's a freaking tyrant, eh? I was blown away listening to her. That's supposed to be a Canadian Irish accent. All right. Good segue. This entire show is going to be Canada centric until we get to the RFK Jr. campaign side of it. I go into my Twitter DMs every now and again. And since they've enabled that um, DMing, even if you're not following someone, and it goes into sort of like request folders like you had on Instagram, and I go through it every now and again, the majority of the time, I go through a few, and then you realize why um, open DMs is just an invitation for disaster. But every now and again, you come across some, some legit ones, and you accept, you interact, you, you know, and that's it. And then every now and again, you get one that comes from a guy named Kyle Kemper, who says he's Justin Trudeau's brother. And you think, okay, I, I, I'm an ignorant buffoon because I didn't know, um, I didn't know a, a lot of now what I know about the Trudeau family, Margaret's second marriage, uh, second or third, second marriage, a second family. And uh, it turns out that lo and behold, Kyle Kemper, it's not just Trudeau's brother. I mean, that's, that's one heck of a shadow to be living under. He's his own man and uh, a very insightful one at that. And now he's working on the RFK Jr. campaign out in Florida. The world is amazing. There are no coincidences. It's just like the cosmos working in a very, very interesting manner. And when you see Kyle Kemper, when I bring him on screen, I think a lot of you are going to say, you two look like you could be brothers from another mother. <laughs> we're we're going to get into all of it. And I mean all of it. When I say all of it, I mean all of it. Uh. All right. Uh, so that's it. We're live. Let me just make sure that we're live on all platforms. We're on Rumble. Let me refresh and make sure it's good there. Uh, da, 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 da. Are we good there? Okay, we're good there. Let me make sure that we're good on Locals. VivaBarnesLaw.Locals.com. We are. And for those of you who are new to the channel, watching for the first time, where the heck have you been? Viva Fry, David Fry, hate Montreal litigator turned Florida rumbler. Uh, live streams, interviews, legal analysis, political commentary, so on and so forth, and the occasional awesome drone bass fishing video. Uh, capture alligators eating turtles. It's just an amazing thing when you live in Florida. The way it works is no medical advice, no election fortification. That joke is old. Uh, we end on YouTube and go exclusively to Rumble, 15, 20, 30 minutes in, maybe 40, depending on how we feel, and then we're exclusive on Rumble. 
After we're done with the stream on Rumble, we head over to vivabarnslaw.locals.com for an exclusive after party. If Kyle stays with us, maybe some questions from the community, we'll see. That's the format. The link to the Rumble thing is in the pinned comment up there, but I'll just periodically keep popping it in there so you can get over there. All right, that's enough. Five minutes intro. Kyle's waiting in the backdrop. Coming in three, two, one. Kyle. Yes. Viva. We might, we, <laughs> dude, Viva. <laughs> Let's go. I looked at when I saw you in the back. I was like, holy cow. Did I, did I, add, is that me? It's, it's amazing. Actually. Our hair is roughly the same length. Your beard is much fuller. There's no gray hair in it. A little right, bit, man. not, not too much coming yet, but. Kyle, this is, uh, it's amazing. It's fortuitous. And I, look, we spoke yesterday and I'll tell everybody the joke that I made you. I'm going to make a lot of jokes about the disdain I have for your half brother. I mean, I'm gonna, I, it, it cannot be avoided. It's the elephant in the room that everybody knows is there. But I've listened to you now. I listened to two podcasts and then some. Um, first of all, I mean, I like your perspective on everything and we're going to get into it. But look, the, the one liner before we delve deep into childhood, tell those who don't know who you are, who you are. Elevator pitch. Wow. Um, hey, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in, being here. My name is Kyle Kemper. I'm a child of the earth, and I was born in Canada, and I hold a Canadian passport. My mother was, or is, uh, Margaret Trudeau. I have three older brothers, or had three older brothers, Justin, Sasha, and Michelle. Michelle tragically passed away in an avalanche when I was, he was 23, and I was 13 years old. Um, you know, I, for the last decade, have been deep in the crypto world and the Bitcoin world, and uh, that just opened up an amazing amount of doors and really got looked at uh, how we decentralize all the things and look towards solutions. Um, pivotal moment in my life was 2001, September 11th, when that thing happened, and I was like, this is a little bit sketchy, and then Luke released Loose Change and was at 2005, I think. Barry Zwicker in 2003 released his book. And then Peter Joseph released, released Zeitgeist in 2007. And then Ron Paul came on the scene in 2008. And uh, oh, this was just like the progression. But in, Anyways. In, in, in when 9-11 happens, you're 16 years old. Right, yeah, grade so 11. Like, holy crab apples. All right, we're gonna back it up. I mean, I mean, all the way to the beginning and like, I'm going to say this up front, like be, not being defined as, but being Trudeau's half brother. I mean, it, it's baggage. It's almost like the um, not living in the shadow in any good sense when it comes to this. It's sort of like being David Grohl and then Nirvana ends and you're like you're the drummer for Nirvana. But now you've, you are you have to define your own existence. And for you, you got to, you know, define your own existence, setting aside what people think about your brother who they you know there's gonna be guilt by association but i think when people hear you talk there's gonna be no more lingering doubt kyle kemper means that you don't have the same father so right. who, who, your father was uh Fried my father's kemper? friedhelm kemper and uh yeah he came over to canada like uh 1952 uh, you know from germany so they kind of his, his father was forced to serve in uh you know, in the German army. And uh, then they emigrated over here. It's tough times getting getting settled, but uh, you know, he has been in Ottawa and is a, a great businessman and a great mentor to myself and uh, love him so oh so dearly. Still alive or not alive? I couldn't He's find still him. alive, oh yeah. And How my grandfather and my grand my my father is seventy two and my grandfather is hundred and two years old and still kicking as well. So Shut the front door. So your <laughs> grandfather, which is Friedhelm's father was mm -hmm. a German soldier. And mm -hmm. when did your grandfather come to America, to, I say America, but come to Canada? Uh, 1952, I believe. So that's your or grandfather comes and your father is born in, no, hold on, if your father's 72, he's still born in Germany, correct? He's born in Germany, yeah. Uh, this is, okay, I mean, there's so many, I don't even know where to start with this. And then my other grandfather, my mother, James Sinclair, who was a very prominent politician in, in Canada, I never had a chance to meet him. He passed away uh, when I was very young. Uh, but he was on, he was on the Canadian side of, you know, World War II. So they're on, you know, either side, so. That's, so that answers one question. Friedhelm Kemper, Kemper was not, a, he was a German German, not a Jewish German who escaped after the war. Your grandfather served. Look, before we even get into this, is Scottish hair. 
do that. I can. Well, that, that could be any. That I mean, there's there's any number of demographics that that hair can belong to. But now, so, like, set aside when you discover that you're Trudeau's brother. What's it like growing up with a grandfather who fought in World War II? Do you ever discuss it? What was your relation? Well, he's still alive. What's your relationship like with your grandfather? Oh, it's fantastic. And you know, a couple of years ago, my wife Brittany, uh, you know, we were down here in Florida, and we, you know, set up a little recording you know, situation and recorded hours of conversation with him and his, his memory short term isn't so great, but the long term is excellent. And, you know, the stories of, you know, what took place then and, you know, the, the, uh, the journey that he went through is very, t is, you know, was very beautiful and informative and scary. Um, like he was almost executed for listening to British radio uh, way back in, in the day. Um, you know, and he was basically smuggled out of out, out of uh, out of Germany, and uh, you know, found found his way to freedom and escaped court martial, etc., and made it to Canada. And then, yeah, and then and then coming to Canada as like you know a German family in the fifties was 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 tough stuff as well. And certainly, my father can tell all sorts of stories about uh, you know how difficult it was growing up as. Uh, you know, as a young German family, um, just make, making it on their own in Canada. And, but anyways, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the story. That's the journey. And where did they land when they came to Canada? Was it in Ontario? I think it was, uh, I think it was Montreal and then ultimately to Ottawa area, somewhere in Ontario. And then they ended up settling in Ottawa. And that's where I grew up was Ottawa from the day I was born and spent a lot of time there and was really sad when not to be there uh, when you were in Ottawa um, for that unbelievable great Canadian trucker movement. Well, I mean, uh, who was that? I was listening to, I hold on, I took a screen grab because you had some awesome insights in that. It was a, it was for a 2022 interview. Hold on. It was called Leaving the Left for Liberty with, um, well, I don't see her name on the damn thing, the podcast where you talked about that. But now, okay, so hold on. So you're, you're born. Uh, you're, I'm born. You're 39 years old. So you're born in 84, give or take. Um, you don't know anything of your family until when? Like, at what age do you start understanding the family into which you were born? Well, I mean, I had always had three older brothers. So they were like 10, 12, and 14 years older than me. Justin being 14. And so they were like my older brothers. And, you know, I learned so much from all three of them. You know, Justin was, you know, this very kind of charismatic leader, center of attention, um, you know, showman. And uh, Sasha Alexandre uh, was kind of the revolutionary. He was over there filming on either sides of the wall in Israel, he was in Chechnya. He chronicled the Liberian secret war that went on in the nineties. Uh, you know, he went, he embedded himself in Baghdad in 2003, when, in, when it was clear that, you know, the U S was going to uh, launch a mega campaign there. And, you know, he got there and he escaped from the green zone and went and just lived with a Christian family and kind of just observed and put himself out there. So you know, I've learned a lot from all the different brothers over the years. And then my, my third brother, Michelle, who is just this most beautiful, pure spirit. Um, you know, he passed doing what he loved in an avalanche out in uh, the Kokanee Glacier a long time ago. Um, so, I mean, I don't know when, like the moment that I realized like, whoa, they're, you know, their father's Pierre. And I had met Pierre and spent a little bit of time with him and, you know, I liked him. And they had a really fun house in Montreal and a cool cottage too. And we had a cool cottage as well. So, you know, I always just kind of grew up, but it wasn't like, you know, I wasn't deep into politics, like, you know, growing up so much. And I think one of the things my mother, like, you know, with my, with my father was a chance to, you know, break out, break away from, you know, the, the paparazzi and the, that, that, you know, all seeing media eye. If you what will. what was the living arrangement like growing up? Because uh, your mom and Pierre divorced in I don't even know the year. It was it was a, it was a ways ago. But growing up, did she I'd have? Say it was like eighty or something, or I don't know. Is it my? I was born in eighty four. That's when that's when I grew up. My I grew up. My parents were together until I was about thirteen years old, which was ninety nine. Fourteen from what, years. From what yeah. Wikipedia said, and then but now, so are you living with the three siblings? Is it like shared custody, or did did your mom? have the most of the time 
No, they lived primarily like they went to, you know, university. They all went to university in, in Montreal, except for Michelle, who went to University of Dalhousie. And uh, but they spent most of their time living with Pierre in Montreal, but they would often be visiting and we spent a lot of time up in my up in my cottage outside of Ottawa um, growing up. So, yeah. And now growing up, I mean, there's so much to unpack because I don't know if you've done for, uh, I'll, uh, no, I won't ask this, but uh, you seem very thoughtful about your 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 history, your upbringing, and life in general. What was it? I mean, M Margaret, your mom, still mm -hmm. alive, mm -hmm. gave a lot of interviews talking about a very you know rambunctious uh, type of lifestyle that she and Pierre had back in the day. W like, when do you recall is the first time you learned about your mom's history? Well, I mean, one of the most kind of eye opening things when I learned her history was when she actually put on her, she did a play with second city in, uh, in Chicago. And, uh, it was kind of like a autobiographical talk play with supporting visuals and stories. And anyways, that was really interesting because she went in and, you know, in a, in a, um, in a almost comedic fashion going over, you know, her very, you know, incredible life. And so, you know, that was like introspective, but honestly, she's just my mom growing up and she supported me and was, and was, you know, was always there and, uh, you know, was, is a very intelligent woman and, uh, you know, and, and a great mother too. I, guess that's just, I mean, that's the other thing is like, it, it's your mom. The world knows her in a totally different way. You know, the, the butt of jokes or the, 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 not the, but also the source of legend in a way, Trudeau is your brother and he's an enemy to many and whatever they have the baggage, but they're nonetheless your, your flesh and blood family. We'll get into whether or not you talk to Trudeau, uh, to Justin in a bit, your parents get divorced in 99, give or take. What was the marriage like up until, uh, up until the divorce? Uh, you know, was, I mean, I'm a kid. I'm growing up, and there, obviously, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. That is a Simpsons <laughs> reference for anybody who doesn't know. A thousand monkeys tapping for a thousand typing for a thousand years. Um, so, <laughs> you stupid monkeys! <laughs> Dude, we're the same. Okay, <laughs> there's going to be some. <laughs> snippets and clippets from predicting uh so th the marriage was was it tumultuous until the divorce did you know what was happening what's it like being a 13 year old kid having your parents divorced and then from the moment of the divorce what's life like i mean then then from you know the separation i spent, lived with my dad a little bit and then with my mother a little bit we lived very close to each other i think you know my mother like after michelle died in in 98 like that was very very difficult for her and you know she's written whole books on the her her struggles with uh with mental health and bipolar etc and so like after you know losing her 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 third son, like, you know, beautiful, incredible, amazing human Michelle was, is, um, you know, that was very challenging. That was challenging on the relationship. And then, you know, and that one, that also like once Michelle passed, that also kind of triggered a real, these sharp decline in Pierre as well. And so then he passed in 2000, 2000. Yeah, he passed 2000. Um, so those were some difficult years for my mother and there were difficult years for my father too. So, you know, but I, I'm in high school. I'm kind of finding my own independence, finding my own world, um, you know, discovered marijuana it's like not the greatest substance in the world but i went uh you know had a had a, had a good journey with that and grateful for its lessons and learnings and probably you know derailed me from uh a career as a pro golfer but uh it's fine now it's um <laughs> let's talk, talk about the first of all how tall are you i'm gonna ask that. In, in terms of assessing your golf <laughs> acumen i'm six six one oh shut the front door. okay well See that we look the same size, everybody. A full six inches taller than me. More than that. <laughs> um, so this is another thing. What's you your mean, handicap uh, in golf? The, or yes. I, there's a lot of jokes about <laughs> that. What's my handicap? Well, I I once golfed a 78. I'm the, be, the okay. best. Okay. The best golf round of my life. I didn't lose a ball. That was, and I kept the ball for a little. Oh, that's while. a that's a darn good round too. Um, I yeah. Mean, well, when I, guy, he was got game. Well, when I lived in Quebec City, I would go. There was a, a period of time where I would get up at five in the morning and golf a round before school every day. And there was this cheap oh, golf beautiful. course. I just go. It was great. Okay, but now hold on. So is, this is 
you you're living a political in a political family there can be no, a tragedy for any family is difficult enough to deal with let alone when it gets politicized publicized and you have to live under that spotlight your, your brother michelle for those who don't know was killed in an avalanche in kokanee park swept away i don't you know living through the era that we live through now there it's impossible for a, any prominent political family to have a tragedy like that without conspiracy theories to swell uh, or swirl i should say at the time this is 98 may, maybe the world was different but was the world any different w do you remember there being conspiracy theories uh plots all these sinister suggestions as to what might have happened or and, and what is it like trying to grieve in the public spotlight of the trudeau family i mean i'm a little house i can't really comment too much about what it's like to grieve i mean i was a 13 year old i'm like trying to figure out how to grieve my in my own in my own sense um I don't think, I mean, like now we're in this age where it's like, you know, there's conspiracies on conspiracies on conspiracies and like, you know, we shouldn't trust anything. And I think that's fair. I think you should, you know, apply a critical lens to it. Uh, but, you know, Michelle, it was early November. He was out there after a snowfall with his friends, um, you know, in the Kokanee Park and early, early season run um uh, avalanche swept him into kokanee lake um his friends were with him watched him the avalanche didn't like you know knock him out he was apparently still swimming and trying to get back in but didn't make it and he sank and then when they came in to find the like to try and recover his body uh, the first thing they need to do is avalanche control all around. So they triggered a whole bunch more avalanches and filled up, filled the lake with it. Mm -hmm. And his body was never recovered. And, but I mean, I've talked to his friends who were there and witnessed it. And it was one of the, you know, the, the toughest experiences of their lives. Um, Personally, I've come to great understanding of this, though, because, you know, there's an old book called by written by John M. All called The Clan of the Cave Bear, and it's this Earth Children series. And they talk about how Mother Gaia, or Donnie, as they refer to in the book, um, every now and then she'll take a child that's too, that's, that's really pure and really beautiful and will take in and, and charge up you know, her own life force with, with, with that being. And Michelle was one of those beings. He was so pure. Uh, he was really like, you know, very, very deep spiritually and had written some prophetic writings about like being okay. And I, I, I think he, he was at the point where like, if he passed, it's, it, it wasn't like, you know, big regrets. You lived a beautiful life, short life, but was then taken into the mother and now, uh, you know watches over us let, let me uh, and i'll ask the the direct question was this the trigger point for getting into uh drugs and other stuff or not not necessarily just contemporaneous oh for me yeah oh no that yeah. wasn't a trigger point now and how does a th it, it's called high school was that <laughs> and peers a, and, and social uh, circles i i i, I um <laughs> But now you were you were close with Michelle before this happened. What was the I was age very was? close with. We were ten years, ten years apart. How does a thirteen-year-old kid? How do you cope with it at thirteen? How do you even understand what what death means? I mean, it's like he's not coming back. So that's it's it's very difficult. And then watching you know your mother, and your sister, and the rest of the family, and you know at the same time you're thirteen. So it's it's uh, it was it was an experience. Uh, and let me, this might this might be a very tough question. Does it create strife within the family in terms of the sentiment that, um, like, whether or not a mother grieving lets lets or creates the uh, impression that the other kids feel less loved than the deceased? Did it did it create any of that type of dynamic where, uh, if you see in movies and they want to be dramatic about it, they say you know like, uh, you, you loved him the most type thing. Was there any type? <laughs> no. Of Okay. No, I don't. I don't think so. No, I, I, or the sentiment that when when a mother's grieving and the living, you know, the kids go on living, can't necessarily internalize. At, especially if you're young, that they're grieving the loss without grieving a favorite um, of any means. But 
Well, actually, like when that happens, it's like you know, a lot of there was a lot of media and a lot of like you know, hoopla around that, and you know, a lot of people asking questions. And again, I'm just 13 years old, so and but I look at my look at then then when Pierre passed again, it was like a real show that at that time. So yeah. Okay. Well, Anywho, we're gonna, that was, we're gonna, this is all, this is all a long time ago. And, uh, you know, these, this was the journeys that, you know, we've all gone through, we all go through, uh, you know, us and, and, and bliss over the course of our journey and, you know, education and, you know, every, each and every one of us has their own little life path. You know, my path has been, uh, fairly interesting. Well, so now, as, let's... As, as are everyone's. Well, it, it, well, that's I was I, I was just thinking this like literally yesterday that you know, everybody you're a snowflake in terms of not being fragile but being unique, just like everyone else. I don't remember who said it. I think my father used to say this to me growing up as a, like, you you are singularly special and unique, just like everyone else. Um, okay, so that's that. Now th- th- this is ninety nine. When does it become clear that Trudeau, your brother Justin, half brother, if anybody wants to get technical, is going into a life of politics? Was it always known within the family? Um, I don't think, I mean, like, I, I would say that there was probably always a sense that, you know, that would be there. You kind of look up to your father. You kind of maybe want to be like your father. You see the, everything that he did. And maybe there, there's a kind of a desire for that. And Justin is the eldest, like, you know, is there and he, and he's again, like, he's a good good showman and uh you know he's very good at connecting with people or was very good with connect at connecting with people um and uh so when did it like start getting clear that he was going to be in politics i don't know i feel like it was he was probably identified very early as someone who would be a great uh great prime minister a great great spokesperson for the corporation um <laughs> and uh yeah and so and i think people around him also recognize that and you know the ambition of others combined with you know self ego ambition um you know led to that and you know he was a, a rafting guide and then he was a, a drama teacher and a, a school teacher and then after being a school teacher out west he kind of participate in two films that don't really think ever got watched by anybody, but, uh, where, but where where can we, where can we find them? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I put, I put that on you. <laughs> like go find them. I, I, I know I don't, what I'm doing this afternoon. Well, All right. Like, now, by the and way, then you... after, and then after that, it's like, and then, and then there was, then it was okay. Like, you know, here, this opportunity to, you know, run as an MP, get, get in like here, we, 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 this Papineau Labelle and, uh, it's not Labelle, it's Papineau, Papineau... In, in, in Montreal. Yeah. Um, oh, I'll get it. Papineau Labelle is the, is the, is the park. Uh, no, not Villemarie. I'll get it in a second. That's the riding. I knew the guy for the PPC who ran in that riding. Um, okay, what we're going to do now, because I'm going to ask you some, now we're going to get into the juice stuff. We're going to do this on Rumble. I don't even want to break up the question. What The question number one is going to be, was he always like this? And I know your answer because I've listened to this, but we're going to talk about this on Rumble. So get your butts over to Rumble. I'm ending this on YouTube. Now the link is there in the pinned comment. Five, and we're going to talk about other stuff too, folks. Yes, we are. No, no, we're, we're, talking about <laughs> R, we're talking about RFK. We're going to talk about your book. Uh, we're going to talk about crypto because look, uh, I know what I think of crypto and I know what I don't understand. I still don't understand it, but we're definitely talking um, RFK sure. and what you're doing with that campaign um, because I, I, I do not think badly of RFK. I like RFK. Stuff you can't say. I love RFK. because Me too. Okay, we're doing that on Rumble, <laughs> ending this in three, two, one on YouTube now. Okay, 